Good evening and welcome everyone to the Thursday, June 17th planning board meeting. Uh, to, to call the order. Um, sorry, Pledge of Allegiance, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Acting Chair Michael LaRue. To the left of me, we have Paul Anacucci and Jerry Grego. And then to my right, Alice Kirby and alternate member Phil Roy. And then we also have um, Amber Fecto on Zoom. First thing is the public hearing, conditional use application, outdoor storage, 405 Portland Street. I don't believe anyone is in attendance for that, and I haven't received any uh, emails or okay. anything like that. So we'll close the public hearing on that. And then the subdivision amendment, creation of one lot, Saddle Hill Drive. I think we're in the same situation. There's got no uh, letters or anything like that, and there's no one in the waiting room. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing on that. Um, next is the public comment. Nothing. Okay, uh, next will be the approval of minutes. And we have the three people here that were here last time, so we can vote on this. <laughs> I make a motion to approve minutes. <laughs> I second. All in favor? No, aye. aye. Now, old business, conditional use application, outdoor storage, 405 Portland Street. I think we went to the sidewalk and checked out the, um, the layout. I think only from a zoning perspective, the only thing that was left over was the uh, screening. I think um, it's pretty clear. Based on state lines and security and safety, it made sense to waive the um, 7.8.5 to that's the first order of business tonight and then I think look for uh, approval. So I guess we're looking for a waive. Can I do that? If I, well, I wasn't on the site well. I'll have to be honest with <laughs> Yeah, I'll make a motion that we waive the um, the requirement for uh, vegetation to be screening uh, the property. Uh, they have a nice fence there. It looks pretty good. I think they're going to take good care of it. So I move that we do that. I'll second that. Further discussion? All in favor? All right. Okay. And there's that. And then the next would be. Um, there's a couple conditions of approval. One was just uh, modifying the, just checking with DOT, three entrance permit. And then the second one was a Knox box that is cheap plant. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking for a motion to approve the conditions of approval. I'll make a motion to approve the conditions of approval. I'll second that. Okay. No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the application approved. I have a motion to approve the application for finding approval. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And the finding of fact. And now approval yeah. of findings of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the findings of fact. Second. All right. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's all pretty straightforward for this yes. one. Yes. The next moving on is subdivision amendment, Saddle Hill Drive, Turner. This was the uh, addition of one lot to a previously approved subdivision. Just uh, wanted to give a chance for the abutters to speak uh, the entire Subdivision was noticed. We received no formal letters. Um, 
So um, for the findings, I mean, a lot of things are either they've been met or, or not applicable, or they're you know the dimensional requirements for a lot from that. And everything else is. Uh, so I think for uh, it would just be a, approval of the findings of fact and then approval of the uh, amendment. I move to approve the findings of fact. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And the approval of the application. I'll make a motion that we approve the application. I'll second that. Okay, further discussion? No? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> I'll just take a minute and let sign them. Or actually, you can just drop them off. Yeah, just leave them. Okay. Yep, have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I like you learned last time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank Thanks. You. You're the same. Okay, moving on. We have a preliminary plan, major subdivision, Hacklinger Lane, and Norman Courts, Medina Acres, LLC. It's this here. That's place for this camera. Right there should be okay. Hey, Dana, I forgot to let you in, but your application was approved. So, yes. <laughs> So um, we continued the meeting from last time. I think the, the main thing was to, to give the board a little bit more time um for any final send off or final approval uh and i think the two things we asked for were the phasing phasing plan and uh, construction plan yes. yep. and my name is neil Raposa with civil consultants um standing in for tom harman and chase stevens who've been previous presenters for this plan and uh at the last uh, meeting we requested that we break out the break out the uh the project into the, the different phases that were proposed uh, as well as uh, outline the construction, uh, the travel construction, uh, mm -hmm. travel through the site uh, during the phases. So we put together put together plans, taking into consideration uh, the infrastructure that's going to have to go in, to serve those uh, those first lots, uh, the water and sewer, and uh, it's all it's been presented on on this plan here. I'll I'll go over with you guys. Do you have a microphone or is it? I think it's just. Just uh, sharing this that I'll just point it over here, see if we can see if they can hear us. Okay, so um, here's the it's the same layout uh, as presented uh, previously. Uh, we've gone through and, and analyzed this uh, so that we would be uh, we'd be developing uh, this portion through here, um, right by Open Space B, uh, as the first as the first phase of the development. Uh, so that would that would consist of uh, extending uh, Norman Court uh, out to here, uh, right about Lot 50. Uh, then we have this open space area uh, accessible for this first phase. Um, and then we'd be bringing Halflinger Lane uh, out here to Lot 30. And I believe this, uh, this consists of the 20 lots, or the initial 20 lots that can be built uh, you know, at, at the same time. Uh, this is going to require uh, the water and sewer lines to be uh, to be built out through here. Uh, we're just going to uh, continue into this cocoa crossing and utilize this as the as the path for our uh, for our construction as we phase through. So this would be initially uh, the staging area would be at that at that crossing. I'm not sure if you guys uh, got out there to park out here during the site walk or not. Uh, but this is an uh, existing cleared area, and there's uh, uh, a woods road that cuts into where this, uh, where the road's going to be going, and another one that cuts through here up on a teardrop court. Uh, so that would be the initial uh, construction staging area, and then we get that built out to 
built out to this area, and then we come into the uh, come to the open space and utilize that as as they are built out through the subdivision to cause the least amount of air disturbance. I can't see from here, but where is the um, the existing the last existing house there on Norman? This is the last existing house is, is right in here. Okay. So this is that last existing house, and then there's uh, the pavement here, the gravel broken pavement stops right in here. Then this is that that kind of radius area that's all crater. Right yep. So we keep that all the staging area. We try to bring everything in initially to to uh, to get the construction to here, and then uh, that would be staged in in this area. Then once we get out to this portion, we try to try to stage everything up kind of out of sight and out of the way of, of the existing lots and the, and the new lots. So we didn't have, you know, gravel trucks coming in all the time. We'd have it uh, stuck right on site here. And from there, this would just be, uh, you know, stumped and ground and roughed in. So we would have a construction route out to, uh, to complete these, uh, these lots and the infrastructure with the, uh, with the sewer pump station at that initial phase. So if I'm understanding you correctly, they, they will not be using Halflinger Lane uh, during this phase for, for this, right, moving removal of right. construction equipment. Yep, they'll, they'll, okay. they'll be bringing things in here. They'll be completing that uh, completing that roadway uh, from the opposite side so they don't have to truck in all the heavy heavy equipment through okay. there. And then once once we get to this, once we get to that point and connect in, uh, this road will uh, we'll work with uh, the fire department to see what kind of turnaround will be required at the end of the phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, you know, maintain a full emergency access to this, and it would have, you know, it would have less than uh, you know, the maximum number of of lots on a dead end road at that point. So that would give them, uh, you know, legal emergency access out there. So how many units are in this first phase? The first phase, there are 20 units. Was there any more progress made? I know we've mentioned last meeting, uh, you guys were trying to negotiate with landowners uh, with regard to uh, easement or right away for, for an alternate uh, road to access the, the development. Has any headway been made on that? As far as I know, it hasn't. I don't know. We, we have not made any headway. We do have two alternate plans that we're currently working on. Okay. We're just waiting to head back from those homeowners. Uh, gotcha. I mean, I can give you I can give you a brief idea if you'd like of what we're. Yeah, please do. Sure. <laughs> um, the two homeowners that we've had conversations with are uh, here and here. So one of the things that we're uh, that we would like to do the, the, the little challenge here because of the type of business that is on this property currently. But if we can get a, if we can access here out to nine, then we'll basically we'll bring this straight across here mm -hmm. and we'll eliminate this section of road. And then we don't have to met, we don't have to cross these wetlands at all over here. We just go straight out here and we think we can configure the same amount of lots, maybe a couple extra lots. So is that strictly a landowner issue that's, that's yeah, holding it up? Strictly, we got to, yeah, you know, so we have to that, deal with yeah, that. It's the landowner and once we once you go in there and, and there is any kind of agreement made, we'd have to uh, you know, delineate all the wetlands out there right. and see if it if it even is less impact. Or so, if it's, so with this, if you could get that right away or easement or whatever it is, uh, if you could get that, would that just leave Halflinger as it exists now, the way it is? Uh, pretty much, there will still be some utilities easements to go through there. Okay. Um, but you know, our, our the desired effect is if we can get access this way, is to not cross these wetlands with the road. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we can avoid it's that, we're going to. Right. You know, but we uh, at this point, this is what we have, and this is the, the plan we're moving forward with. But if we if we would prefer to go that way, but I so have you have you made initial contact with the landowners? I have. have so okay. we're at right now. With, uh, I've spoken to both of these. Both have expressed interest. Um, we have some sketch plans that I need to present to them and see if they'll uh, see if they'll go with it and if it's if it's economically feasible. I mean, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we're not the town. We can't say I'm in a domain and we're going to take it. Right. And like I said, you still don't know really what 
is out there as far as natural resources. And right. Have to work yep. around. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a great concept. We just have to make sure it's, it's a feasible, it's a feasible option. Gotcha. Yep. This, yeah, this is this is what's what's available to us now, and and, and is you know uh, a, a plausible plan, and, and everything everything checks all the boxes. It's just you know we're trying to look for you know, the best way possible. Mm -hmm. I move with them. I have four conditions for the final plan for the preliminary approval. One simple crosswalk to the library, it's just paint, but it can be good for. Across from Norman Court to library, traffic calming. Some detail on the sidewalk. I mean, you can barely see it on the plan, just how wide it is, where it goes. Yes. I mean, the three is built in anyways. We just want that, the traffic study. That's the residue to that. And then four, just to clarify, what I'd like to see are just, and then that might be built into the traffic study anyways, are recommendations. On the school street or Pine Hill Road uh, intersection. They're not necessarily requiring you guys to do the work, but it'd be good to have some recommendations on it. So, yeah, so I think I'd like to expand because I, I see some people here that expressed uh, big concern in the public hearing about the traffic on Old Pine Hill Road and the rate of speed that they travel at. Um, I had a conversation with uh, um, Captain Locke today. And he said that they have done a, um, a, you know, you see when they put those things up that say speed limit 35 and your speed is X, they collect the data from that and that tells what the average speeds are. So, so we have that data available. I don't have it here tonight. I just talked to them today. We do have that data available to show what the actual speeds are on Old Pine Hill Road. Um, you know, I don't want to speculate on what that report says, but he he indicated to me that the speeds on that road are not as fast as we think they are. I think that I think people treat that like a drag strip, but he's saying the data doesn't doesn't support that. But uh, but we can get a copy of that report. That's that's public information. So James and I discussed several things, um, and I think that you know looking at that data will help guide us. James is talking about a crosswalk across the road there, you know, with some signs crosswalk. Um, you know, we also discussed doing a, um, a speed, speed table. Speed table. Um, you know, and, and none of those things, you know, are huge expenses. And I'm not opposed to doing what will make that area better. Um, but I think that, you know, um, at this point, James is asking us to at least a crosswalk there. We have no problem with that. If we look at the report from uh, Captain Locke, you know, the traffic study says that we should do more than that. The discussion we have at that point. Um, so you know, I just want to be clear that we are looking to improve the neighborhood. And, you know, if that if that's going to help, then you know, it's it's a relatively small uh, cost on a project this size. So, because I because personally, I I probably on Old Pine Hill Road. Aside from this, on the other side of the road, north and probably on south. And I said to him, I go, you know, I, I plow the property on Old Pine Hill Road South. And I got to tell you, even in the snowstorm, when I'm plowing, it sure seems to me like people come down that road like it's a drag strip. Mm. But he has the actual data. So, you know, we can review that and make, make you know, intelligent determinations based on that. But so, I, so I'm basically just what James is saying, that, you know, I have no problem with. Uh, the recommendations that James and I basically passed out as to work outside of the scope of the, the project here. How many are in phase two? How many units? Uh, I'm not sure what it says there, but I'm sure we're shooting for 20. Okay. There's 19 in phase, in phase two. 19. Okay. <laughs> May I ask a question? Just with regard to Old Pine Hill Road and, and what you were saying with the excessive speeds, what is the process to get the speed limit reduced? Would that be an option perhaps for you? That maybe 35? Or a selectman issue. You would have to talk with them about that and go from there. It can be great. Right. Right. For a, a, a stop sign, it has to meet like there has to be a re, like a reason for it. 
can't just put a stop sign for traffic purposes. It has to be like, there are so many, it might need it because of some of them, but it has to be like so many left turns, so much traffic. I'll look, I'll look into it. I'll see if it meets it. The school street intersection is one that needs to stop. Oh yeah, I wouldn't be against, I wouldn't be against that. You're right. That might traffic light meet the, or at least a stop sign. What has a stop sign? Full way. Yeah. Oh. All right, well, continuing. All right. Is, James, is there a mechanism for us to activate that on our end with, with the selectmen, or, or is that something that yeah. has to come from the town? I would prefer, so there's design, I mean, there's, there's speed limits, but there's also like design speeds. I mean, it's this Old Pine Hill Road. We have our hands full with the, the downtown with our traffic coming, but um, so it'd be hard to. Do anything in a timely manner to be honest with you but the, the real way to control speed is crop or sidewalks and crosswalks and bump, bump, narrowing the street that's the way you actually get people to slow down you know the speed limit on old pine hill road is 35 and on school street is 30. isn't that a state road school yes 30 there. Do we, do we control it? Uh, yeah, control if you're going to talk, you have to talk on the microphone, and we're kind of getting off topic on this. So we're kind of right, going into yeah, this. It's okay. I know you guys have concerns, and that's that's fine. Um, moving forwards, um, what are we? What are so we the um, uh, approving uh, the, the preliminary plan subject to the conditions um, laid out. Yeah. At that point, that just puts us at. There, they get to go ahead to go to DEP and we back in six plus or minus months. Yeah, well, I don't know if you guys do the condition that it's approved by DEP or, or do you wait for that to get the final permit before you'll give the final approval? Um, I mean, I guess that's something we can. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think yeah. we were expecting preliminary approvals. Yeah, they, I mean, the condition could, that we get the approvals. Yeah, but that'll be the final final approval made by that condition. On it. You still have to go through and get final after after the preliminaries. Yep, there's still plenty plenty of time with DEP to hash a lot of stuff out. Mm -hmm. so yes, approval movement. Yeah. I'll stop. I'll move, move to approve. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. What was that? I'll probably send out the genes. It's, it's going to be it's just a a preliminary approval. If yeah. DP comes back and says, and it's done, right? Out. Now notice if we have that's yeah, sure. Right, it lays with down the can you know? If they can get that other road, that would solve two problems. Okay, next up, uh, new business, Central Services Solar Farm, 259 School Street, 259 School Street, Solar LLC. We're here, this is the uh, third solar farm the planning board has reviewed. Uh, sketch plan, so it's nice all about general comments, getting an introduction from the project, and uh, giving that our uh, direction forward if you have any questions or outstanding concerns on the project. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Sudak of Atar Engineering uh, here on behalf of NH Solar Garden and SOW Solar Incorporated. I have Andrew Keller of NH Solar Garden calling in uh, remotely. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, Mr. Chair or Mr. Planner, um, it's been a while since I've had a piece of new business here with the board. So how would you like me to proceed? Brief overview of the project? Or, yes, okay. Um, Andrew, would you um, like to go first? Maybe just a brief introduction on who you are and your involvement in the area. Sure, happy to do that. Can the board hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all for having me remotely. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there tonight. Um, as Mike said, I, NH Solar Garden is my development firm. We're based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 
Uh, I've been developing solar projects across New England for over 10 years now. Um, this area is my home. Um, I, I lived in Southern Maine most of my childhood and I raised my children over in Portsmouth Stratum area and uh, focused a lot of my attention originally in the New Hampshire solar market um, as it was evolving and closely watching the market in Maine uh, with the hopes of being able to do some work in the state that I grew up in most of my life. So when I had the opportunity to come over and, and do a few projects in Maine, um, obviously we were excited and especially ones that are so close to home. We have a few others that are going on in different parts of Maine uh, and working with ATAR uh, to help us with the engineering. So we've been very involved um, since the beginning of the Maine program. And um, you know we've been watching what the kind of industry has been going through, some of the challenges um, and taking from some of the experience that we've had in other markets to, to work with, with Mike and his team to bring forward what we think is a very um, organized plan um, the project currently, uh, and I can have uh, Mike go through some of the details on the engineering, but um, the project is currently being studied by CMP. Um, we should be receiving our uh, study back from them very soon. Uh, so that started, I believe it was back in January or February. Um, and with some of the slowdowns that you may have heard in the news about CMP and their study process, we've been held up a little bit, but we anticipate seeing our results coming back um, here very, very soon. So um, I'll have Mike kind of walk you through some of the specifics on the engineering. And if there's you know any solar specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. I, again, I know that your town is you know one of the few towns that has quite a bit of experience in Maine with some of the other products that are uh, one under construction, and a couple others, I believe, that have gone in front of this board. So um, I'm pretty optimistic that Mike has done a great job kind of organizing the site plan and coming up with some good strategies to make sure that it's kind of low visibility, kind of in the back 40, um, and working around some of the, the, the details that we've uncovered in our survey process um, last fall and into this early spring as well. So uh, again, happy to answer any questions, but I'll hand it back over to Mike to kind of walk you through the, the site plan. Thank you, Andrew. All right, I'll turn your direction to the uh, easel material. Um, hopefully, I'm going to try and orate from here. If you need me to go over and point, I can do so. Uh, so this is 259 School Street. Um, this is so on the intersection of School Street, which is at the bottom of your page, and Heritage Drive on the right side of the parcel extending vertically. 69-acre uh, parcel in the R2, so it's Transitional Residential District. Um, Existing condition, uh, there's a single family dwelling in the southwestern corner um, of the property on the School Street frontage. And the remainder of the frontage along School Street and most of Heritage is a really, 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 really nice field. Uh, as Andrew described, the, the back 40, um, once the field has left, is mostly forested upland aside from some uh, forested and non-forested wetland, and then the watercourse channel for the Malloy Brook that you see along the left side of the parcel extending um, vertically running from north to south. Um, let's see, uh, in terms of what we propose to do, um, just a, let's see, uh, math off the top of my head, a 440 table solar array, so that's around 10,000 just over 10,000 uh, individual panels. Um, overall acreage, I believe, is in the ballpark of 15 or 16 acres of occupied area uh, serviced by a small gravel driveway. Um, all of the other usual solar array trappings, perimeter fencing, some clearing for southern exposure uh, for the service of the panels themselves. And let's see. Um, mapping that we've completed so far, we've completed our wetland delineation, vernal pool delineation, uh, stream bank survey, uh, soils delineation is in progress, and touching on the vernal pool side, the transparent hatch in the middle of the property there is a significant vernal pool that was identified. Um, the line work that you have in your packets is slightly larger than uh, what the area ends up being. Um, when I picked up the flags after this application was sent in, but it's still a large one. It's on the order of like 14,000 square feet, so it's a big boy. Um, so we have a critical terrestrial setback that we'll have to um, apply for a NERPA through and keep our um, disturbance to beneath that 25%. So 
fully intent on adhering to that. Um, and I think that concludes my overview. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So a couple of questions, and sure. we've, we've been getting a quick education on solar <laughs> with the board, um, but uh, just a couple of issues with, with regard to uh, ATAR. You guys have been uh, doing this for roughly 10 years. How many uh, solar farms have you guys decommissioned? Decommissioned? None to my knowledge. Okay. That, and that's a concern for the town. And the only reason is, you, you know, there's a lot of lead and cadmium in, in the solar arrays themselves. If, if for some reason... Uh, Atair goes out of business, the landowner is going to be on the hook for the cleanup. If the landowner defaults, it's going to default to the town. Okay. Um, other industries who have come to the board previously have been amenable to setting up a bond or assurance of some type um, up front that would be held, you know, uh, for specifically for decommissioning. Is that something you guys would be amenable to or that you've done in other, other areas? Uh, I um, if you like. Go ahead, Andrew, please. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. It's a, a very common question that we handle. Um, and again, the, the intention is to make sure that both the landowner or the town isn't left with um, a problem. If, if something went astray 10 years down the road, solar is, you know, taxed a hundred dollars, uh, you know, an hour for adding solar to the grid, you know, and the business goes away, we want to make sure that there's no issues for the landowner and ultimately the town. So, uh, the request of the town is is very reasonable. We're we're happy to you know hear out what the town has done with some of the other applicants. Um, you know, having some type of surety is is pretty standard. Um, this solar array, looking in my background, is the the Milton landfill not far from you guys. That we I did that project about four years ago. Um, where we understand the importance of you know the sensitive nature of certain um, pieces of land, uh, regardless if it's an old cap landfill where there's a lot of waste underneath the ground, but it's still a sensitive site. So, you know, working with a, a kind of a virgin piece of property, um, you know, we, we respect that and we'd be absolutely open to something consistent with what you've uh, addressed with your other um, solar projects in town. Okay, great. And then the only other concern uh, from a perspective of public safety is if, if there's an issue or an emergency on the property, uh, access for the fire department and the police department, and they, they know what the hazards are as they enter that area. So... Uh, we we would just want a good, you know, brief with them so they know what they're getting into if they have to access that area. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we want to build that into our notation language in the plan set or discuss it at pre-construction meeting, however we need to handle that, that's excellent. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, there's also the opportunity. Sometimes we have like well, like a manual or you know some type of uh, something that could be left with the fire and police department. Um, typically, the, our mentality, obviously, is that if there was a forest like fire outside the, the panels, obviously, we'd love to have the fire department protect our equipment. Uh, if it started inside, we'd be obviously looking for the fire department to really protect the abutters. And unfortunately, it'd, it'd be a shame if the panels you know, were to be affected by something like that. Um, that's what insurance is for. So you know, I think it'd be appropriate for us to you know, if we need to do a pre pre meeting, we will. If there's some type of a, a manual of explanation that they can have on file, those are also very reasonable requests that we're happy to accommodate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, we set up a surety bond, uh, and they had a, a third party um, do a, like a report on projected cost of uh, decommissioning. I think it was about a hundred thousand dollars. And then um, the one of the conditions would just revisit the um, decommissioning plan every five years for any inflation costs or anything like yep. that. Yeah, um, I think one one detail you just brought up that's important is the way that we've worked some of these in other communities is just as you said, it's a, a check in every you know certain period of time. Five years is reasonable. Um, because as we all know, the decommissioning price today could be different tomorrow. You know, if there's a higher value for steel or aluminum 10 years down the road, you know, and your number you quoted doesn't seem, you know, unreasonable compared to what I've seen in some of our past decommissioning plans. Um, maybe that comes down because steel is at a premium in 10 years. But I think that's, a, again, a fair and reasonable request to have a check in every five years and make sure that it's fair for both parties and, you know, nobody's being left, you know, holding the bag, so to speak. So uh, I have a question. What what is the projected life of this farm? 
So typically right now, the solar panels, as they're purchased uh, in the market, they have a 25 year warranty. Um, that's a production warranty. So based on how much power they'll produce, uh, solar panels are meant to decrease their production a little bit, about a half a percentage each year. Um, so if for some reason there was a year you saw more than that production um, come down lower than that amount, that's where the warranties kick in for panels, for example. The inverters, which is the other major component that converts the sun power you know, from DC to AC power, um, those are usually 15, 10 to 15 year warranted items. And um, so both of those together kind of create a warranty structure for the ownership of these projects. Um, typically our uh, agreements that we have to share the power or sell the power to um, under the net energy billing program are typically 20 to 25 year uh, um, agreements. So we try to align the agreements to sell the power close enough to where the equipment manufacturing warranties are. That doesn't necessarily mean that at year, you know, day one of year 26, that every panel is going to not work um, or every inverter is going to fail after year 10 or 15. Um, my experience over the last 10 plus years in this business is that I have had some inverters have some warranty issues where we had to, you know, call in those warranties and have them, you know, have them replace them for us. Um, knock on wood, I've yet to have a panel um, not work in, in over 10 years of installing these projects. Um, so. A little bit more information, but that just gives you a little bit of background on how the projects are organized and how we kind of see those warranties in the life of the projects. Last point I'll make is that there are panels out there that were manufactured over 30 years ago that have are still producing more power today than what our panels are warranted at in today's manufacturing. So they can last and do last longer than the 25 year life. Um, so again, our land leases are usually aligned with that 25 year period as well. And if in 25 years from now, every, you know, cost of electricity is high or there's a need for more solar, uh, we have the optionality to extend the lease with our landowner. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a couple more um, uh, issues that, that are always on my mind with solar, uh, with solar farms. And that's number one, the impact on the existing homeowners and abutters. And uh, you know, what's it gonna look like for them uh, considering where they are relative to this? And the second thing is how visible is this gonna be from people driving by on School Street? Uh, are they gonna look out there and wow, there's this huge solar farm or is it gonna be screened in such a way that it is not an eyesore from the highway. So those those are my two uh, questions here. I can I can take those, Andrew. Go for it. Um, so a um, couple, I guess, additional information. So um, I've had some conversations with DOT since uh, School Street is a state road. Since the application materials have gone in before you, I didn't want to bring revised content to discuss something you haven't seen, but. Um, my conversations with the DOT, because of the dual frontage nature of this parcel, we basically won't be allowed an additional entrance on the school street frontage of this property. So the gravel access drive, as it is currently depicted, um, will not be. So our, our gravel access drive will have to come in off the heritage uh, side of this parcel. So in terms of the existing dwelling that's there, the access is going to be nowhere near them. Um, and secondly, the location of the array as it's shown on this sheet um, is also slightly out of date. The, the critical terrestrial habitat associated with that vernal pool um, kind of just came into the plan set as I had the application deadline for this project. So the entire array proper will be located completely north of that 250 foot setback. We don't intend on having any panels within that setback. Um, it's kind of hard, or it's, it's not kind of hard, it's impossible not to have the gravel access drive go through it without negotiating a crossing of the Malloy Brook that I don't want to do. It wouldn't be reasonable for us to do. So um, we're going to have to have a little bit of an impact to it. But as far as what School Street sees, I mean, you have um, 
I took a dimension right before I left because I knew this question would come up. We have like 500 feet of distance between the back of the field and where the array itself starts. So School Street itself won't even know it's there. Um, and concerning, <laughs> which is a good answer, which is <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a good answer. And concerning no. the utility corridor itself, which will still have to come down and tee into School Street. Um, we intend on preserving the nature of the field that's there. So the entirety of that will be underground. So um, yeah, just to echo my statement earlier, School Street um, travel way won't know it's there at all. So thank you. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Andrew? No, I, I, that was that was perfect. No, I really can't add much. I think the distance from the road is, you know, it, it adds an element of kind of sh shielding it from the people driving by. It's not going to be right on the main road, so it won't be creating traffic issues with people, you know, swinging their head left as they drive by. And that was kind of our intent to put it in that back 40. Rubbernecking. I do that on 236. Yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. We all do. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. It's starting to grow in, though. Yeah. <laughs> Any day. No. <laughs> you answered my question about the the panels being moved out of the area. And then you created another one. You said you're going to have a road coming in off of Heritage Drive. Where would that be? So the... If I had to, to get to guess right now, it would probably be this most. I'm going to come over to the board. It would probably be this most northerly section of our heritage drive front end and L out into here, and the panels would be extending there and backwards. Um, like I said, it, it, there really is no way around at least impacting a little bit of that 250 foot setback. So we're going to try to position it in a way to keep that percentage as small as possible. What is exactly being impacted in that area? In terms of what has been the you said there was a significant ecological. Yeah, so the, we um, had a, a site evaluator perform a vernal pool study, um, go out and check eight masses, and there's a pretty large. I, I don't have the letter from the EPA in front of me as to what specific it was, but it's on the order of like a fourteen thousand square foot vernal pool area. So because it was deemed a significant vernal pool. There's a 250 foot setback from the limits of that that's deemed a critical terrestrial habitat. And uh, under miracle provisions, we're only allowed to impact and impact anything, creating uh, gravel, curve structures, anything up to 25%. Uh, Which is going to be the road that you use for you? Yes, access. and the only impact contributing towards that number will be our access drive. I assume you guys will have you will have to have protections for the vernal pool as you're creating the road. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. You built in to your airport permit. Right. It'll probably just be a more uh, zooped up version of erosion sedimentation control. Right. But, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> I look at the topo map here, but I, I'm having a hard time making heads or tails of it. I haven't been out there myself. Is this is this a high spot or a low spot or? I, it, on the topography, what are we? It's relatively flat, honestly. Is it? Um, it, okay. it isn't much of a low spot. So all of the wetlands and the eastern side of the property, these, these fingers down here in the field and these back here really are um, more wetlands in, in soil than in like depression and maybe okay. standing water. Um, but that, I mean, that one's enough of a bowl to have egg masses in it. So yeah. um, it, but it really appears the setback's far enough. My, my, I guess my concern is with the, the south facing panels. If yeah. anybody's coming on School Street, you know, at a certain hour of the day, are they going to get blasted with light in the face? I know that's been issues on in other solar projects. Yeah, no, that um, the, the solar panels are, are meant to absorb the, you know, the sun not reflect. I mean, the only reflectivity that you have off of solar panels because the the glass that's used is like has like an anti glare kind of sheen on it is. Um, like some of the, the aluminum around the perimeter of it. But, um, you know, we have not in any of the projects that we've done had an experience of it, especially being this far from the road, being, you know, over 500 feet, like Mike said, um, having any impact on traffic. We have to do like FAA um, submissions to make sure there's no impacts. And they're obviously hypersensitive to glare. 
Uh, and we've done that um, and we received back that there was no additional requirements of us um, with the FAA. So I'm not sure if that adds any comfort to the board, but that, that is a requirement. We have done it. We have completed that process as part of our survey work. And um, so we don't really see glare as, as a typical thing from solar panels like this. Thank you. And just one, one little piggyback off of that. So the elevation relief difference, I know that the contour labels are a little small, I apologize. Um, between School Street with ele elevation 210 and then basically the top of our vernal pool setback where our first panels would theoretically begin is elevation 240. So okay. you have 30 feet of difference there, but you have, again, as I said before, 500 feet of trees and preserved canopy that okay. will. Yeah. One question I had, Andrew. So you guys are you gonna you build the farm and then manage it long term? That's that's your your business model. No. Um, so my our business model is well in different capacities. The answer is yes to that. But in this capacity, we're the developer. Um, so we own the project right now and we will own it until start of construction and then we have an ownership group that will come in and be the financial you know owner and will um, hire the like a, a regional or national construction firm solar specific construction firm called an epc firm um, who has the bonding capacity and construction capacity to build these type projects and then our role after the fact um, historically has always been almost like the uh, like a, I wouldn't say a pro almost like a property manager, you know, where we're going like the liaison between the, the community and the project ownership. Um, this project, again, behind me there in Milton, and we did the other another one on a landfill in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Um, as the project matured, uh, you know, there might be a new uh, town manager that comes into town that wasn't aware of details that took place when we put the project together. So they would always reach out to our firm because we're again we're the local company we're here you know we're seacoast local and um stay on to make sure that they have access or if we have to provide any connection to the ownership group we're there so we we are the developer um that's kind of the lane we stay in and uh, but we again being the local company we're here to, to help out in any way we can you know post construction good thank you I just had one more question um, in regards to clearing. I know that you mentioned clearing the area. Um, do you plan on planting anything else to kind of act as a buffer for the abutters? I think, I mean, can you speak to what the, the kind of setbacks are of the natural buffer that's already going to be there? Yeah. As far as, as far as planting go, though, there will be, you know, after the trees are cleared and stumped, there will, you know, we will, we will revegetate the area around and under the panels, um, you know, with a meadow mix. Um, we are looking into some pollinator mixes as well, so we can reduce some of our um, O and M costs and also to en enhance the habitat out there. So that's a really important detail in solar projects nowadays. So uh, my wife actually works with me on these projects. She's kind of managing that for us. So we're looking into that as a, a solution for kind of enhancing the habitat in and around, but Mike, maybe you can speak to some of the buffers on what the scale is on the plan. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, let's see, so I, I think we've kind of put to rest any any school street abutters and, and the uh, legitimacy of whether or not they'd really see anything at all of the array, but maybe some of the, the rear yard setbacks or the rear, the backyards of um, the heritage drive abutters I mean, solar panels, as per the town definitions, qualify as buildings, so they have to comply with building setback, but we've kept the array itself and all of the clearing and perimeter fencing, and I'm looking at my scale there and drawing a rough line. It looks like at well over 100 feet from any side line that has a residence right now or could have a residence. I think Heritage Drive might be expanding. I, I don't remember. Um, if civil consultants has something before that. Um, but I mean, we'd be happy to, to consider it if, if something like that comes up and is, is deemed necessary to, to happen maybe in response to public comment, if we do have some heritage driver butters come in. 
Um, but right now, I think there's more than enough adequate distance to to ensure that really nobody's going to see it. And I think uh, basically on the site walk, yeah. we, can, we can take a look at, at how that looks and, and see yeah, to you know, what, what the impact could be. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next in new business, we have recreational facility, gym for Fiddlehead Lane, Mason. Even nature of four fiddlehead lane is proposing to construct a 1,000 uh, square foot pole barn at its residence for a fitness facility and as deemed a recreational facility, which is allowable under conditional use in the R3 and AP zone. The building will have one unisex bathroom, a dedicated septic system for the building. Mr. Mason stated in his narrative that the offerings will include weightlifting, personal training, and strength and conditioning. The operating hours are supposed to be Monday through Friday, 8 to 12, and 4 to 8, and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, so it's one uh, relatively small building. Um, in the entire, there's just one, one room in the building that's used for the general fitness and then the, then the bathroom. Did I get everything, Stephen? Yes, that is correct. Is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, not specifically, no. No, that's going to be it. Tonight would be determining uh, application completeness, and then if complete, I would suggest setting a public hearing and a state walk for July 15th because we're off for July 1st. Mm -hmm. Is uh, this well and septic or sewer and well, public water? Yep. So, this is off of uh, Old Stanford Road. So, there's going to be a new um, subdivision. I think you're, there's only one or two houses on Fiddlehead, right, Stephen? Yeah, there's only one currently. Uh, we're in the process of building ours on the same lot. Seems like it needs everything. So can we just make a motion to... Find a complete. Yeah. All right. I make a motion to find this complete. Second. Okay, for discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And the next should be to uh, schedule the site walk and the public hearing. Yep. So for July 15th, and then five o'clock for the site walk. Okay. Five o'clock work for you, Stephen. What what time was that again? Five o'clock on uh, the fifteenth, July fifteenth. Uh, that's five p.m. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's. <what> I, <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> we can do five a.m. We can do five a.m. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. See you then. Glad you can make it on. Okay, next will be the yeah. next public comment. I have uh, no one in the my inbox. Okay, then informational items, other than no meeting July 1st, as per bylaws. So the next meeting will be July 15th. Yep. Okay. You guys deserve it. Happy <laughs> for it. I got one thing. Uh, uh, Great Falls Construction has a permit for the L-shaped building. And they are looking to have tenants this winter. So you're going to see that building completely transform by, I mean, say by the springtime. And again, um, Great Falls, they, they, um, they'll continue picking at um, the debris out there. They can use some of that um, as fill. Um, but they have a site, site permit, and they're hoping for, through DEP, and that, that could be a six-month-plus process. 
-hmm. So that puts them at the timeline about January, February. So for the major state work, that puts them at like March, April, the, the starting the more significant work. But keep an eye out for the L-shaped building. Right. Okay. That's it. Okay. Anyone else? There's no further comment or questions live from the esteemed Burgess Room in the depths of the Berwick Town Hall. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good night.